A new financial crisis has developed recently in America, and the trail of destruction it could leave behind will look nothing like what you might expect. In fact, I believe nearly 40% of the elite publicly traded companies, brands you've known and used your whole life, could go bankrupt because of a strange market event I call a flipping, wiping out thousands of investors' fortunes. I just finished writing a brand new report explaining exactly what the flipping is and how billionaires are already profiting from this big event and what you should be doing to prepare as well. To get a copy of my new free report with all the details, simply go to mccallfreereport.com. Again, that's mccallfreereport.com for a free copy of my new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 16th of August, 2022. A beautiful Tuesday down here in Nicaragua. However, it was not so beautiful last evening. Therefore, we are going all audio today. We had some issues, but you do have some times when you're traveling in some third world countries. But we'll be back up to normal here very quickly. But we still got a great show coming up for you. We're going to talk about the markets, all three major indices breaking through significant resistance levels and the bull market in the NASDAQ continues. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about gold. We're going to talk about Bitcoin. We're going to talk about oil falling into a bear market. And then we're going to dive deeper into the what they call the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has nothing to do with inflation or reduction. And it might not even be an act. But we're going to talk about that and then several themes. And I'm going to name some stocks that I think will be big players in the next decade as climate control and more spending on renewable energy comes through. So all that and more coming up right now on an, I apologize, audio only version, but still a great show right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is August 16th, 2022. Happy to be here. Happy to look at these beautiful trees out here and happy to be here with you. Uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we got a big show coming up. But first things first, I want to thank all the viewers out there over the last uh, week and a half or so. You know, our last three shows have combined over 100,000 views. Uh, so we, I, I'm loving to see the, the support that we're getting, uh, the comments. Granted, 95% of them are saying I'm a dummy. But I still appreciate you taking the time to uh, tell me I'm a dummy. So that all works out well. But again, don't forget to like, subscribe, uh, comment. We do like the comments, good or bad. I, honestly, I do. Uh, but try to be a bit respectful. I don't care about the other people. Uh, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well, because that's what we're here. We're truly here to help. And the three pillars of this show, as I've always said, we want to educate you. We want to have fun. And of course, it's in the name of the show. We want to help you make money over the long term investing in solid companies. So without further ado, let's jump into the markets right now. So heading into this week, the S&P 500 has had four consecutive weeks uh, of ending that, that week uh, on an up note. So it's got a four-week winning streak. And that may not sound like a lot, but you think about where we were just a month ago and how freaked out everybody was. And it's actually extremely impressive as to where we've gotten as of now. And uh, on the charts, the S&P, believe it or not, is now very close to its 200-day moving average, which the 200-day moving average is a simple moving average, means you take the closing price of the last 200 trading days, you add it all together, and divide it by 200. Tomorrow, you do the same thing. So you lose day 201, and you take the 200. And that's the average price of the last 200 days. So it gives you a bit of a trend of where the market's been. The S&P right now, uh, the 200-day moving average is just a couple ticks, about 1% above where it is right now. So that's extremely impressive. Uh, it broke that big downtrend line that I talked about about a month ago, and it's continued to stay above there. The same time it did that, it broke the 50-day moving average, well above that at this point. So it has truly turned its way in to a very, very viable uptrend over the last now two months. This isn't a two-week counter rally, two-week rally in a bear market. We've truly seen a big rally when it comes to the S&P 500. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, which is the uh, 30 big industrial stocks, you know, also tech stocks there now, it actually closed above its 200-day moving average uh, just yesterday. It's above the June high, which was significant resistance for it. And so, again, we're seeing some very strong performance out of the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest companies in the United States, publicly traded, 
then the Dow, which is a mix of 30 stocks, very large, but in all different industries. And then we take a look at the NASDAQ. Uh, the NASDAQ is a uh, composite, which is uh, several thousand stocks. And uh, it, it's really a huge range of, of tech to financials, you name it. And the NASDAQ composite has rallied from below 11,000 back above 13,000 now. Still below the 200-day moving average, but similar to the S&P, way above the 50-day moving average, way above the old downtrend line. And it's been moving higher now for about two straight months. Uh, and believe it or not, it's over 20% off the low. And you know what that means, folks? That means essentially, according to, you know, not Wikipedia, but encyclopedia, whatever you want to, according to the whoever made up the term bear market and bull market, there are 20% moves. So a bull market's a 20% gain. We are now in technically a bull market because it's more than 20% off the low. I know it doesn't feel like a bull market right now, even though a lot of portfolios have done very, very well over the last two months. Uh, our portfolios for our subscribers included, my personal portfolio. Um, that being said, they're still well off the highs of where they were. Because keep in mind, the NASDAQ composite was above 16,000 in November of last year, and now it's at 13,000. So we're still down quite a bit from where we were, even though, again, we're well off the recent lows that we've hit. But it's, it's pretty amazing how we've seen this turnaround, and uh, it, it's, it seems to have momentum. I mean, every week over the last couple of weeks that we've uh, had this rally, you look in the weekend and, or you turn on the you know, financial news, which is garbage, and it's, everybody keeps saying bear market rally, bear market rally. And yeah, maybe they end up being right, and this is just a, a really pr pretty big rally in a long, long-term bear market. I don't see it happening. Uh, as I said a lot of times in the last couple of months, we've priced in such bad news that unless something dramatic happens, that the Fed goes ballistic and really goes 75 basis points next couple of meetings, which I don't think happens, um, unless some type of I'm call it black swan, it's called a gray swan happens where maybe something escalates in Ukraine, Russia, maybe something escalates in Taiwan, China, uh, you know, the, the Chinese Sea, uh, something with Japan. I mean, there's always kind of things that could happen. I just don't see that right now being that catalyst to put us back into uh, a really ugly bear market. I think we've likely bottomed in a lot of big, strong stocks and likely bottomed in the market. I said two weeks ago, about 60 percent chance of a bottom. I'd say it's about 75 percent now because the strength that I'm seeing is now indicating that I th feel like we've created this bottom in the market just in the action and the underlying action that we've seen so far. Again, I might be wrong. But, but you, you want to be looking to buying on dips and just building positions throughout this for long-term investing, folks. Well, one area that has not been doing as well, uh, two areas, I, I, let's say. Uh, first, let's talk about the U.S. Uh, home builder confidence number. And that came out yesterday, uh, on Monday. Uh, it's now down eight straight months. That's the longest losing streak that we've seen since 2007. We know what happened in 2007, 2008. That was really when the bubble uh, burst for the housing market in the United States. It's now down to 49, below that 50, 50 level, goes from zero to 100. Below 50 is negative. So down 49, first time it's been down that low since May of 2020. So right after the pandemic started, essentially. What I found interesting within that number, one in five home builders, though, have slashed prices in the last month. That's not good for people trying to sell, but that's the first step in a market correcting and it's the first step of getting affordability back to a level that most Americans uh, can really take on. And, you know, I've been looking for a house, eh, kind of, not, not actively, but looking uh, in the state of Florida and South Florida since January. And I kind of put it on pause because the prices were just absolutely bananas. I don't know the South Florida market, but I can look back in history and see a house is up 150 percent or they're asking 150 percent what they paid for it three years ago. That, to me, is probably not the best buying opportunity. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting, holding, but I still look a lot and see. Uh, also, you know, I'm renting because I'm not buying. And I will say the rent for the townhome I'm in is absolutely bananas, and they're actually raising it already. It's, it's, the rental market is really, really out of whack because uh, housing is getting to a point where the affordability index is not good, forcing people to rent. Uh, and then obviously the supply demand issue, let's rents go higher. So that's the one issue I do see with the economy right now is because, you know, shelter is a big portion of, of what we spend our money on. So that, that could be something. So we want actually, I'd like to see home prices come down. I'd love to see rents come down. I think that actually will be a good thing 
uh, when it comes to uh, the overall economy and helping especially the middle class, low middle class out there that could be living paycheck to paycheck. Another area that's suffering a bit, and that's oil. Um, oil fell yesterday to a low of $86.82 a barrel, believe it or not. Um, and when it, when it comes to oil, people say, well, that, darn, my oil stocks are down. But what that does mean is it's going to equate to lower prices at the gas pump. It's going to equate to lower prices for heating your home or cooling your home. So that essentially, again, is something good for the economy. Uh, it closed yesterday just below $90 a, a barrel. But that low that we hit on Monday is the lowest level we've seen in uh, crude oil, West Texas Intermediate, they call it WTI. That's what's based here in the United States. Came down to 86, 82 a barrel, the lowest since February 3rd. So that should take some pressure off inflation, uh, which in my opinion, again, will be good. It may say what the Fed's doing is actually working or it's just a natural cycle uh, and may force the Fed to not be as aggressive, which again, will be good for the market. So I, I think, you know, some of the negative stuff is setting up to be positive in a few months. Um, so a lot moving, uh, a lot of moving pieces here, folks. But again, it's starting to set up something that looks pretty damn good. Now let's talk Bitcoin and gold real quick before I get into these clean energy areas I want to talk about. Um, Bitcoin continues to hang around at 24,000 level. So Bitcoin's trading just below 40, 24,000. It, it did attempt to break out of the weekend. It came close to 25,000 per token. Uh, Ethereum was around 2,000 trying to break out. It's now down about 1880. Uh, both those are obviously number one, number two cryptos. They've been hanging around and forming a very tight consolidation pattern. I see that as a major breakout coming at some point. Timing wise, I don't know, folks, to be honest with you, but I do see a breakout coming and, and I still like them long term. Gold, on the other hand, uh, had bounced, believe it or not, uh, the dog that it is. Uh, gold did bounce uh, over the last three weeks back up to the 50-day moving average. I had a big down day yesterday, down a little bit here today. To me, this is a bear market rally because it still continues to have lower highs, lower lows, and I still would stay away from gold. And, you know, Bitcoin has actually done much better than gold uh, in the last couple of months. So I, I, I look to Bitcoin just being better. And again, people always yell, well, how do you like Bitcoin and not gold, et cetera? Um, for me, it's not one or the other. I just prefer to like stocks and Bitcoin now over gold. That's just how I feel right now. Speaking of which, I have a programming note. Uh, on Thursday, a good friend of mine I've known for well over 10 years now, uh, Matt Hogan, who's a CIO over a CIO at Bitwise. They have a couple ETFs that track uh, Bit, uh, Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrencies. I'll have him on a show on Thursday talking cryptos, which would be a lot of fun. Um, so now let's get into the crux of the show here. And, um, you know, this weekend I'm looking for different, different topics to, to talk about on today's show. And I came across a really nice article on Bloomberg. And the article was talking to um, some scientists and futurists about where they kind of see clean energy and the, that type of climate investments going between now and the end of the decade, which I call the Roaring 2020s. So I thought that kind of fit in with a lot of themes we talk about. So I want to take those seven trends that they discussed that they think will happen between now and 2030 at the end of the decade, based on big investment, not just from the new Inflation Reduction Act, but from all types of government subsidies throughout the world and, and governments and private companies spending money throughout the world uh, for clean energy, renewable energy. So I'm going to go through these, give my comments and then share a couple stocks for, for a few days as well. One of them was uh, what they called improved air quality starts at home, is what they said. And uh, what they really got down to was uh, most houses will be all electric by the end of the decade. Everything from heat pumps for water to space heating, uh, it's all going to be driven by, uh, by electricity. So that's uh, going to be that big move without obviously using as many fossil fuels. The one thing when I read that, I'm like, OK, even if it's an electric house, right? Even as an electric house, how are you getting the power for that? It still might be coming from a fossil fuel uh, utility plant, right? So I, unless they're all saying, well, it's going to be renewable, it's going to be running off uh, solar that's on the roof or whatever it might be. Uh, maybe it's, it, it has to do with better uh, energy storage and batteries that they can then store and harness that, even sell some back to the grid. But for that to happen, we need some more uh, improved battery innovation. Uh, we definitely need to upgrade our grid. So a lot of things need to happen in eight years for, for that to, to come to fruition. But I, I do believe we will see more electric, more uh, you know clean energy, renewable-ish type homes, greener homes. I, was, I didn't want to use the word greener, but uh, kind of fits there. And two companies that, that fit into that is one is Train. 
and the symbol is T R or sorry, the, the name of the company is T R A N E. The symbol is T T. And uh, Train does a lot of HVAC and that type of stuff. And uh, we'll be working with the futuristic homes. Uh, another one's a carrier, which you probably heard of. Again, in the HVAC area, C A R R is a symbol. Those are two companies that could definitely get a lot of play as newer homes upgrade to this or, or are built with the more futuristic uh, way of, uh, of a clean home, a renewable home, and then also upgrades of uh, pre-existing homes. So those are, those are two companies to keep an eye on. Number two was uh, electric commercial trucks will be big and it's overlooked. Um, I think I said it's overlooked. This is something I truly believe in. Uh, you know, I believe in EVs, electric vehicles, but what I think we're going to see really have a bigger penetration um, is going to be uh, electric um, trucks. And when I talk trucks, I talk commercial trucks, whether it be semis uh, or even just uh, big F-150s used in, in commercial and industrial areas, because uh, I think you'll see them start moving uh, corporations and even small companies moving that way before we see individuals. It's going to go hand in hand, but I think we're going to see a big takeoff in that. The global, the global electric uh, vehicle truck market in 2019 was about 422 million. Uh, by 2027, which is about five years from now, we're looking at about 1.9 billion. So you're seeing some really, really big growth, uh, over 4x growth in eight years from 2019 to 2027. Uh, so I, I really think you're going to see some really uh, great investment opportunity in there. And um, when it comes to the global uh, fleet sales market, when it comes to truck, Trucks, Ford, believe it or not, is the is the big leader in that. But there are some smaller names and some newer names trying to get into it. Um, obviously, Tesla has been working on a semi truck and, and you know autonomous semi truck, and that's where it's going to go pretty quickly once they all go electric. They'll probably go to autonomous pretty quickly. So Tesla obviously is that, and they are also working on a cyber truck, which isn't as much as uh, for for industry and commercial, but the cyber truck is out there as well. Uh, Hylion, which is symbol H Y L N. Uh, they make powertrain solutions for commercial uh, trucks. So um, they have a, a, a truck called the Hypertruck ERX. That's a long haul electric vehicle truck uh, that, they're, that they're working on as well. So that, that's one to keep an eye on. And that's a smaller company, less than a billion dollars. Um, HYZN, Hyzon, which is another one, less than a billion dollars, also in this space. Uh, then there's Nikola, NKLA, which I don't like, but I want to mention it's in this space. Also working on uh, big commercial electric trucks as well. I'm not quite sure who comes out as the big winner here, but I will say it is definitely an area that you cannot ignore uh, because it's not as sexy as some of the cool EVs that are coming out. But this is truly big money, and these, these vehicles cost a lot more than a normal EV, and you're going to see fleets um, all over the country and all over the globe start changing over to electric. So this, this could be a, a big play. Uh, next one was uh, more supply chain transparency. And I'll kind of get into what that means, but it, it's really based off of um, the credit that 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 the government's giving you for uh, electric vehicles. If you're buying a new, a brand new electric vehicle, that credit's up to seventy five hundred dollars. Um, but not everybody gets it, you know. So make sure you you know that if you're trying to buy a, a you know a vehicle based off that. Two things to keep in mind: one, there is a uh, income restriction. If you make over a certain amount, you don't get it. Uh, number two is um, the trucks have to, or the, sorry, the cars have to meet certain criteria as well. So for this, um, there's two, two little criteria. Each one makes up half of it. The first one is that the battery has to be assembled in the U.S. Um, so it has to be assembled here in the U.S. Uh, the other one says that half of the key battery materials must be mined in the U.S. or in countries that we have free trade agreements with. So basically, uh, say the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so a lot of the, um, let's say, cobalt and other uh, materials came from there and ends up making over 50 percent of the battery. You don't qualify from it because they're trying to get the auto manufacturers to go to places in the world where there's hopefully not child labor, et cetera. Uh, so what the author said about this was more supply chain transparency the companies will be more open as to where their different materials to build the vehicle are coming from and where it's actually built. To me, I look at it as more of a um, investment opportunity. And because this means that we're going to have more concentration on some of these metals, especially rare earth metals, which I love. And I'm going to be putting out a new portfolio this week about that for our, for our subscribers. And I actually just recorded a, a nice video all about that. 
and uh, just how big that sector is going to be. So rare earth minerals, and we have a couple companies based in the U.S. Uh, that are working on that. And then one's working on a refining plant. One is the largest rare earth miner in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, then we also have some companies that do some recycling. Uh, one is Lycycle, symbol L-I-C-Y. It's a Canadian company, but it's the largest uh, recycler of lithium in North America. And, um, you know, we, we, we rely on, obviously, mining of lithium and other uh, very important materials for batteries. Uh, but we also need to rely on recycling them because uh, the demand is so high that we need to recycle these as well. So a lot of different ways to play this, but this comes down to me, not as much about the supply chain. And that's nice to know that, but it's more about batteries and battery materials and how important they are. The next topic they mentioned was that cities will reach 100% electrification. And uh, I found pretty interesting here. A lot of this has to do with me too, uh, IOT, IOT, Internet of Things, smart cities. All this connection based off electricity, I get that. But again, I go back to one thing. Where's this electricity coming from? If it's not renewable, it's still running off fossil fuels. So we got to keep that in mind. But I saw that they put a good study in there that 20 to 50 American buildings uh, have not had an energy upgrade in about 40 years. So that's 40% of American buildings have not had an energy upgrade in 40 years. Think about that. 40 years since I was born. No, they haven't upgraded it. Think about that. not this building, it's where I'm in Nicaragua, but think about these buildings that you're in, your office buildings. Hasn't been, that's just amazing to me. So we're going to see a ton of money going into that. Um, three big companies. I, I think you look at engineering companies. You go back to the HVAC companies I mentioned, whether it be Carrier or Train, there's several others. Some engineering firms that do this. There's uh, Johnson Controls, JCI, uh, Honeywell, big conglomerate, HON, uh, LSB Industries, which is similar as LXU. A lot of players in this that will help really kind of retrofit and upgrade uh, large buildings to make them more energy efficient, uh, help electrify them, and basically move them into the 21st century is, is what's going to happen. Another one said uh, slower uh, rising seas. All this will lead to, to you know sea levels not rising as quickly. And I just think of New York City when I think about that, or New Orleans, for example, two cities that, that deal with that. You know, I was in New York City when uh, Hurricane Sandy, I think it was, hit and the whole, you know, downtown was flooded. You know, I, I lived in Midtown, Uptown area and was fine where I was. But yeah, a lot of friends who lost cars, lost all kinds of stuff, uh, evacuated from their places, subway stations flooded, <clears throat> Wall Street flooded. You know, it, it was really bad. So I know they're working on big seawalls down there, but that could just help inner, uh, inner cities, uh, concentrate cities that are on the coast. Uh, when it comes to that. Uh, but the other, then they, they came out, the last one was that there's still going to be higher temperatures. And yes, I mean, I, I don't give my thoughts on, on, on climate change. I let people decide on their own because I'm not a scientist and don't pretend to be one. So you have your own thoughts on that. But, you know, I really wanted to cover this and just show you, you know, these are trends that will be around for the roaring 2020s and beyond. And it all has to kind of get us, you know, juices flowing with the IRA that came out, that Inflation Reduction Act, which has nothing to do with inflation, more of a climate change bill, if anything. But it does get our juices flowing and gets us thinking of ideas. So a lot of stuff I talked about, you can start building a portfolio based off this and just the trends that are going forward with clean, renewable energy, uh, not only here, but abroad as well. So market's down a little bit this morning. Uh, but again, we've had a hell of a run the last four weeks. We started off strong on Monday. Uh, things look great. Could we have a little pullback for a couple of days or a week or two? Absolutely, uh, because you don't go straight up. But overall, markets are looking pretty damn good right now as we get ready to wrap up at summer, head into fall, kids go back to school, people back in the office, hopefully. Uh, so we got a lot, lot to talk about, a lot going on in the next couple of months going into the end of the year. A lot could be happening with the Fed coming up in September. Um, so, you know, lots, lots to do, lots to keep uh, our eyes on. But thank you so much again for watching. And don't forget Thursday, got Matt Hogan coming in from Bitwise. And uh, who'll here, be here talking about anything and everything, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, excited for that. And we'll dive into our thoughts on uh, some of the top tokens out there right now. So thank you so much, folks, for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.